Hi, this is Justin Coletti. You may know me from Sonic Scoop, but today I am here with Sonarworks, who are launching their new Sound ID reference platform. What used to be called Sonarworks Reference is now Sound ID Reference. It's still the same awesome solution for correcting your room, speakers, and headphones. And we have this great set of panel discussions going on right now. And today's is all going to be about enhancing listener experiences in the the digital age, on streaming services, on music sites, on social media, and really making better listening experience for end fans and listeners, and creating more opportunities to connect as musicians and fans, as artists and listeners and followers. So we have a really great group of people to talk about that with. First is Justin Gray, who is a tech entrepreneur, a musician, and a producer. He's worked on an amazing number of records uh, with some great artists, uh, including the likes of Avril Lavigne, Mariah Carey, John Legend, uh, David uh, Bisball, uh, Josh Stone, a whole lot more. Records that he's been on have sold 40 million copies or more and more than 8 billion streams. He's worked in film and TV and advertising, so really excited to have him on. Justin, can you say hi to everyone? Everybody, thank you for having me here. This is going to be fun. All right. Great to have you on. Uh, also really excited to have on Kristen Chen. She is the director of products at SoundCloud. And the particular set of products that she's focused on are those that are going to enhance listener and audience relationships. So she's really all about trying to figure out ways to better connect the artist with the end listeners and enhance the experience for both of them. And I hope that she's going to have some great insights for us as to how artists who are establishing great followings online and great connections with their audiences are able to do that. And maybe there's some best practices we can learn from that. Kristen, can you say hi? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Justin. Really excited to be here today on behalf of SoundCloud and loving the SonarWorks pajamas too. Yeah, I should have mentioned we're all Hopefully one of these days, all of you watching out there can be cool enough to also have these new Sound ID Sonarworks pajamas. Super comfy. I would say the highest quality polyesters available. <laughs> Thanks in no small part to a man sitting in that very comfy chair in his very comfy PJs, uh, a friend of mine and a guy who I think is just a wonderful, brilliant guy to talk to. His name is Martin Spapellis. He's one of the co-founders there at Sonarworks. And he is the chief product officer around uh, all the Sonarworks reference stuff. So he knows this product better than anybody. So really excited to hear some of his insights because his whole thing is about improving listener experiences through Sound ID, through the reference program. So Martins, thanks for being here with us. Hey, uh, so great to be here. And I'm uh, also really excited to be part of this conversation. So. Wonderful. Well, this is a lot more about hearing from these guys than it is from hearing about me. So I want to get into our first question right off the bat. It might be nice to go into some kind of quick case studies. Like, what are some of your favorite examples in this past year of artists connecting with fans or audiences in kind of new and unusual ways? Um, I'd love to hear from you guys on this. Uh, Kristen, can you give me some examples of where, what do you think are some of the most exciting and interesting new ways that artists and fans have connected in this kind of unusual age that we live in now? Yeah, absolutely. It's definitely been an interesting, I guess, past year. And especially at SoundCloud, we've seen a lot of fantastic trends. I think What's been really um, inspiring for me to see personally is deeper connection between artists and their fans. Um, and also at SoundCloud too, um, we've been engaging in a lot of different best practices around live and grassroots culture support. So wanted to highlight two that have um, been really fantastic during this past year. Um, the first one is that we've been hosting a lot of different fast track live sessions on Twitch where different creators can come and jam with us, get feedback on their tracks, or you can even have live Q and A with the artists or best practices from the SoundCloud teams. Um, so anything from SoundCloud 101, if you're just getting started, um, to expert advice, which has been a lot of fun. We've also seen some really interesting scenes emerge throughout all of this. And we even launched an original scene series to shine a light on several thriving niche movements that have emerged on the platform and tell the stories behind these kind of fringe creator communities that have been changing music culture and how they're next in music. Happy to dive into more details, but I'm sure that Martin and Justin have a ton to share on this topic too. 
Yeah, really interested uh, to hear more about that because there are like these little mini subgenres that kind of emerge out of SoundCloud. And I'd love to hear a lot more about that dynamic from you. Before we get into it, uh, Justin, would love to get any insights of yours. Are there any remarkable moments that you've seen in the past year that really kind of highlight that idea of new ways of artists and fans to interact? Yeah, uh, it, I mean, I, I definitely come at it from a different perspective because I'm in the studio making the records with the artists sort of before they get into SoundCloud, right? So uh, I, I think that what's emerged in the last year to the huge advantage of artists is the fact that because we've been kind of, you know, cooped up, uh, I think, and probably Christian would agree, there's, there's way more activity online. There's way more discovery. You know, you're seeing artists that are uh, taking advantage of, of technology, taking advantage of platforms like SoundCloud and being able to now really reach an audience without having to have the pressure of, oh, we need to tour. So from that perspective, um, it's been actually an incredible time of growth for artists that I've worked with. You know, I've seen artists that I've worked with that have tripled, quadrupled their social media following uh, just because they're, they have, they're doing the work. That's what they're doing is they're creating content. They're posting that content. They're reaching out to fans directly. I actually think long term, you're going to see a deeper fan connection to the artists because of this sort of moment that we're all living in together. Right. That's a great point that people who maybe weren't on their social media game and online game as much as they could be, have been incentivized to really get that part of their act together, which is going to be so essential going forward. So really, there's a, a little hidden blessing in kind of every curse, right? You know, the sure. uh, silver <laughs> lining in every cloud, and that's one of them. And I've seen some really amazing examples of people taking to live performance in online ways that uh, would have just been, you know, inconceivable before. And the amount of content that people are putting out in a live interactive way has been pretty amazing. Uh, Martins, do you have any thoughts about this, just the new ways that people have been connecting in the past year yeah. and any uh, interesting examples of it? Yeah, the thing, the thing that stood out for me was the uh, Travis Scott uh, concert in the... Uh, in the Fortnite uh, gaming platform, oh, yeah. like uh, where I think it's kind of uh, what I think is cool about it is that this is kind of artists finding new platforms, new outlets to actually engage with their fans. And I'm kind of personally really interested in how this gaming world, which is also now definitely on the rise with whole, this whole COVID thing, but how the gaming world is now kind of blending more and more with the real world and kind of giving live concerts on a gaming platform, which if you think about it, I, I actually just looked it up before this conversation, but Fortnite has like a population of uh, 350 million of players. Wow. So that's like the population of United States and yeah. this kind of Travis Scott thing apparently gathered like a 45 million audience online in this gaming platform. So I'm kind of, uh, my kids were definitely watching it as they were playing the Fortnite. So it's kind of, uh, <laughs> that's awesome. uh, it's definitely, uh, it's a uh, kind of a, uh, new channels, new platforms for how to reach the audience, I think is uh, what's uh, exciting. Yeah, uh, we have to not get locked into the kinds of media that were important and central for our own type of music discovery when we were young, you know, mm -hmm. for those of us who are, you know, past our mid twenties and into our thirties and even forties and so on, the way that we experience music growing up and we're exposed to it isn't necessarily the best way to meet new, younger audiences. I think that's something to keep in mind, something that the Fortnite story really illustrates very well. I just um, yeah. want to add to that. This, this is the best thing about having a 16-year-old voracious music listener in my home, aka my daughter, is that also the habits of listening is different, right? Um, and, and, you know, for example, I mean, just go back 30 years from now, you know, ago, you know, there would be seven, eight minute songs, right? Now, songs don't even have bridges anymore, you know, because it's people are in and out. I mean, there's so many times I'm listening to records with my daughter. And by the time the last chorus comes, she's out. <clears throat> we don't need it. She's already had that, you know, she, she's, she's, she's consumed it. So uh, songs are getting shorter, they're getting more succinct to the point. Um, and, uh, and it's so the listening behaviors have changed. I think you make a great point, Justin, Justin C. Yeah, I wanted to also just jump in. Um, so I work at SoundCloud now, but a couple of years ago, I did work at Twitch. So it's been really interesting to see gaming and music come together. And you called out Fortnite Martin. SoundCloud recently hosted a player one gaming tournament. Um, and it was really fantastic. And I think as you were saying, Justin Gray, um, just the listening and consumption behaviors have really changed and people are really looking for whether it's, you know, behind the scenes experience or even um, these immersive experiences to connect even more closely with the creators and artists. Right. And there's sometimes a little bit of a difference between reaching raw numbers, which is important, and 
audience interaction, which is also important because I've seen mm-hmm. some artists who will have a YouTube channel and they'll get, you know, good numbers of views there, but then they'll separately have a Twitch channel. And although the viewership will be maybe smaller numerically, the engagement is so much higher. And these are sometimes maybe the most dedicated fans who are maybe to a degree, bigger revenue source for the artists, but also just more fun because they're really engaging and into that live uh, experience and aspect of it. So um, another interesting thing to note about platforms. We can talk a lot more about building audiences, and I want to get there, but Sonarworks is really a company that has been so focused on helping people improve their sound quality in the studio by trusting their monitors better than they could before. And uh, I, I'm a big believer in monitoring. I really believe every studio should have decent enough speakers that you can trust, um, some degree of acoustic treatment that makes sense for your needs to really help improve things. But a crucial component of that that I wouldn't have said 10 years ago that I recommend to everyone now is a type of EQ correction, an intelligent type of EQ correction like Sonarworks Sound ID Reference provides, allowing you to be more instinctive in your work and just make decisions instead of second guessing yourself. So that's the tremendous value I've seen it adding. And maybe I can we can start off with you, Justin Gray, because I know you've, first of all, have a really lovely set of speakers behind you and a whole bunch of lovely stuff <laughs> behind you. There's some really good looking uh, focals. I think those are maybe the trios, the trio sixes or trio 11. I don't know. You have to play the name game for people who aren't nerds, but you have some great speakers. You're in a nice room, but you still like the sonar work stuff. Can you tell Love us it. why Sound ID Reference has been useful for you? And also tell us about the role that sound quality you think has or doesn't have in connecting with end fans and making the music mean more to them. Yeah, those are great questions. Um, yeah, those, so those are the the elevens, um, uh, and and I and I love them, uh, but it's not about them. What what? And, and in fact, it's not really about the speakers. I want to just sort of like jump off of that for a moment. It's about the room that you're in, right? Uh, speakers are speakers. Look, there's there's tons of great music that's made on crappy speakers, right? There's tons of great music that's mixed in headphones. Uh, but it's about the room that you're in. It's about it's about correcting that environment. And, you know, I was kind of, I, I was a bit, <clears throat> I wouldn't say old school in my mentality, but the idea was, well, I'm, you know, I'm I'm five feet away from my speakers. I, I don't, the room correction is not, is really not relevant to me. But I'll tell you, uh, what I've discovered is, A, I get to the, I get to the creative finish line faster. In other words, you know, I'll do my mix, I'll do my car test, I'll do my earbuds test, I'll listen on the phone, you know, on the speaker on the phone. And, Oftentimes, depending on which listening environment I'm in, I'm going to make adjustments so that I don't really, I, you know, I can't ever say I'm really happy with a mix personally. It's just sort of like, it's kind of okay in all of these environments. But what I've discovered, does that make sense kind of? But what yeah, I've discovered absolutely. is, uh, I again, like I said, I, I, like to, I like to work quickly. So getting to the finish line as fast as possible, you know, it's looking at, uh, you know, tr- things that I've, I typically always do on my master bus, let's say going, oh, wait a minute, those don't work as well as I thought because I'm getting a much cleaner perspective now on how I'm listening to it, on, on how I'm listening to music. Also, by the way, it helps me when I'm referencing against other tracks that I'm trying to be competitive with, right? Mm-hmm. So if I'm streaming something on Spotify, um, I can get a better sense of how they're matching without the coloration of the room affecting my mix. And by the way, I, I, I not last year, but I travel a lot for work. So I'm often in headphones, I'm finding those mixes are trans are 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 are, are trans um, uh, translating much better, and ultimately, you know, being a nerd, and this is where I'm going to hand it off to Kristen for a moment, is <clears throat> being a a, an, a bit of an audio nerd. It's how do I make sure that a listener is getting the the intention, the creative and artistic intention that I'm meaning to, you know, uh, uh, portray once I'm done producing and writing and mixing a song and working with the artist. I want to make sure that when the listener hears it, they hear it as closely as it's meant to be heard. And um, that's where I think there's an incredible compatibility between what's coming out of the studio and now what's, you know, going into people's headphones. Uh, And I think that's Mm -hmm. completely elevating the experience for me and for somebody that's hopefully listening to my song somewhere. All right. Kristen, what is your perspective on this from the other side where you're hearing so much from fan feedback and listener feedback 
Um, how important is sound quality to end users? And do you have any ideas about what kind of devices most of your listeners are on? Because a lot of people are listening on the desktop apps where they might have you know, sophisticated headphones, or they might just be on a laptop speaker. Some people might be listening on their iPhone, which could mean they're hooked up to a high-end set of headphones, or it could mean they're listening to the internal speaker. So what's your perspective on this? How much the sound quality and means to the end listener as part of really engaging with audiences? Yeah, I think Justin hit it right in the head, right? It's, I love the idea that, you know, creators are getting more kind of intention for how they want the listeners to hear it. And that's what we hear from listeners as well. They want to connect as closely with the creator or the artist behind the music as possible and sound quality. Um, I mean, SoundCloud with, without audio streaming, what would SoundCloud be, right? Sound, sound quality is at the center of this experience. And I think what's really interesting about SoundCloud in particular is that we notice a lot of things that are uploaded onto SoundCloud are special because they're raw or early releases, et cetera. And a lot of artists and creators actually use SoundCloud to get feedback on these early kind of versions and tracks. And so I think that could be a really interesting area to explore, especially as creators and artists are getting more um, in better tools to control that quality. So I think that's one thing I wanted to call out. Secondly, I think what's really interesting about listening and consumption, you asked about devices, most of our listening is mobile. And I think what's fascinating too is when we, I often, I guess with my product hat on, I try to make sure we're looking at US versus non-US, emerging markets, et cetera. And you'll notice, especially in a lot of emerging markets that most people are doing everything on their phone. So very mobile first. So I think, you know, sometimes you have a speaker, sometimes you're in the car, but oftentimes it's just you right on your phone or with your, with your headphones. Sure. And um, Martins, I'd love to get a, a sense for you about, you started a company to help people get better sound quality, more accurately trust their mm -hmm. stuff. Um, how important do you think sound quality is in this? And mm -hmm. once you've talked a little bit about that, I'd love to hear a little bit more about some of your solutions because most people listening to this have probably heard of the basic SonarWorks reference now called Sound ID reference is really meant to mm -hmm. correct speakers and correct headphones and room environments. And like mm -hmm. Justin said, your speakers are only as good as the room you're in. It's almost more about correcting the room than the speakers. So uh, give us a sense of what y you think is the importance of sound quality to end listeners. But then I'd love to get a sense for what you're trying to do for end listeners, because the new Sound ID product that's aimed at consumers is a lot different than what people are used to in the studio. And I think that needs some explaining for a lot of the people in this audience who are uh, less familiar with what you're doing on the consumer end. Sure. Now I can go on for an hour answering that type of a broad question. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big question, but I, I love to yes. hear you talk about this stuff. Sure. Uh, so I think to, to, to start with the first question of uh, does and how much does sound quality matter, I think it's kind of a little different, but connected, but of course, for the music creators and music listeners. For the music creators, it obviously matters because as Justin just said, kind of it's about making sure that your intention is getting across as good as possible, right? So you wanna, as an artist, you wanna maximize your chances that you've did the best job to get your piece of art and you're moving people with the music that you just created. So for them, sound quality is obviously a very central element to what they're doing. Why would you want lack of sound quality to kind of get in your way between what you wanted to create and what somebody's hearing? On the consumer side, from our perspective, and I think it's also guiding the philosophy of the products that we're making, I think it's, true that for consumers the for the listeners the uh, kind of the simplicity and kind of convenience of getting sound is like 10x more important than the quality itself for the broader market kind of mm -hmm. if if you can kind of get your f sound out of your phone on your table and that's the only way you're still going to listen to music kind of because it's convenient but if you can get better quality without losing the convenience, then obviously everybody wants to maximize the quality. I mean, there are many ways where people will remember their experiences of, hey, I heard that hi-fi speaker and it was such an amazing experience that I continued chasing it throughout my life or something like that. So if convenience is there, then definitely consumers are willing to maximize the quality as well. And that's what our products are also about, kind of about extracting maximum potential quality from the situation that you're in, kind of utilizing smart technology 
to actually get the best possible sound experience without losing the convenience, if that makes sense. So, yeah. uh, so I think quality is important, but on the consumer side, kind of convenience and availability is kind of uh, more important. But uh, once that's granted, then the quality is also interesting. Right. That's super important because I, I mean, sometimes people will denigrate the kids these days for listening to the music <laughs> on their laptops or on their iPhone speakers. But I remember enjoying music immensely and discovering so much music on an old boombox that I have that I would load tape cassettes into. And it actually, it wasn't quite working right. So it would play them like, you know, a few cents, maybe like a quarter step slower than it should have. So I heard like all my favorite music slightly and not in great sound quality, but it didn't stop me from falling in love with that music. And it was there, it was avail available. I could pop stuff into it. You know, friends would dub each other, uh, you know, mixtapes and all that and share music in that way. And to me, it sounded amazing because the music sounded amazing. Uh, and of course, as I got older, I started to get more and more into hi-fi sound. But yeah, the biggest obstacle for young people is absolutely, young people in particular, but everyone, is access. I'll even tell one quick story. This is how old I am. There was a service where you could dial up on the phone and hear samples of songs. This was before Napster and you could just download any song that you wanted. You would literally call this number and you could type in um, artist names you hadn't heard and hear through like a payphone, this 1-800 number, like a 15 second snippet of songs so you could get to know different bands. And I would do that. And that was obviously terrible sound quality, but I spent hours doing that, you know? Um, to figure out what uh, I should spend my allowance on, you know, for the next record. So I think a lot of people have memories of that from when they're young as well, of compromised ways they listened and really enjoyed. I wanted to just add something because we're in a very exciting time. It's cheaper than ever to make music. More people are making music than ever, and more music consumption is ha more music consumption and ha is happening than ever. And I think we're in an, in an incredible time. And by the way, you know, back talking about what you're talking about, Justin, for a minute, you know. There used to be like five ways for an artist to make money. Now there are literally hundreds of ways for artists to monetize their career if, the, if they're, you know, if they're if they're entrepreneurial enough. And um, and I, I mean that's a whole different conversation. We're not going to get into that. But I think we're in an, we're in, we're in, we're in a gold rush uh, for for music creators and music consumers. Mm. I love uh, your optimism there. And I think there's a lot of truth. There's a lot of new people making careers for themselves, sustainable ones in new ways that weren't possible before. Um, and also it's something I do have to say, uh, you know, services like SoundCloud and all the streaming services, um, as much as some hi-fi people like to denigrate them, it is arguably the best ever consumer sound quality. I mean, a streaming MP3, particularly 320 kilobits per second, but even at 128 kilobits per second is objectively going to sound closer to the source than a vinyl record, than a tape machine at 15 ips per second, than a cassette player, than practically any, than AM radio, than FM radio, than practically any other consumer format ever. So in a way, we're living in this golden age of consumer sound quality. Just the quality of headphones you could now get for $20 or $40 or $50 or $100, you know, generations past, absolutely pale in comparison to what's available. So sometimes when I hear people denigrate sound quality today for end listeners, I roll my eyes a little bit. It's true when you're listening on a speaker on your, your phone or your laptops, it's not ideal, mm -hmm. but there is, it's just so many, so much better in so many ways. And I also have to get a sense from you, uh, Martins, about the sound ID product that's aimed at consumers. For those people who haven't heard it yet or heard of it yet, the sound ID reference that so many of us in the studio know and love for correcting our speakers and rooms and headphones, that's about making things flat so we can make better decisions. And when you guys, to my understanding, the story goes, when you started to show off this software to end consumers and say, here's how flat we can get your sound, end consumers didn't like it. They don't like flat because flat is boring. You found out that people like excitement, but each person likes excitement in a different way. And you create a product to kind of address that. Can you walk us through how that works and kind of what the end goal is? Sure. You're, uh, you were right on spot when you were uh, doing this introduction through the question. So basically, as you, I mean, the core of the problem is that all the speakers in all the rooms, all the headphones on creator, as well as on the listener side, sound different because of different acoustical and physical reasons and whatnot, right? So on the creator side, what we have been doing with Sonarworks and what we are continuing to do is provide the creators with the flat, neutral, consistent reference sound across different locations, different devices. And that helps a lot 
to improve this, uh, what is called in the creator world, the translation of the song, that when you're done your mix, it translates to the outer world. But in reality, as soon as your song leaves your studio, it still sounds very different because kind of I might be wearing a Sennheiser pair of headphones as a listener. Somebody's wearing a Beats headphone. Somebody's listening on the phone just lying on the table. So everybody's still hearing a different version. And uh, most often that's not the most optimal version or that's not how the artist really wanted that song to sound. So uh, that's still the translation problem is there. Kind of everybody's hearing something else and it's not optimal. It could be better. And uh, as you, Justin, just said, kind of, the first thought that comes to mind and that we actually pursued as a company a few years ago was to say, hey, we can calibrate all the headphones and speakers. Let's do it on the consumer side. Let's bring the exact studio sound to the consumer. They should be excited. They should be able to get as close as possible to the artist. Everybody should be better off and kind of you don't have to worry about the translation problem anymore. But we found out that not enough people like that type of studio sound. So some people did and some people were really excited, but eventually not enough listeners loved it. And uh, we ended up doing a huge research uh, with like over close to 40,000 people participating to find out, hey, so what sound do people really like on the listener side? And we found out that it's really everybody likes something else. And when you think about it, then people's preferences for different things are really different. Like somebody likes bananas, somebody likes strawberries, somebody likes blue color, somebody likes red color or whatever. And our hearing is actually, and, and it's the same thing about sound. Somebody likes a lot of bass, somebody hates it, somebody likes treble, somebody not so much. Our hearing is different and it really changes with age. So uh, just like actually most other things in nature, kind of these tastes are... Uh, personal so for each person out there kind of the best possible sound is actually a personal matter so kind of the best possible sound for me as a listener might be a different sound for my kid as a listener or for somebody else so uh, that's what we found out and then around this insight we really by the way the, the the difference is really tremendous like if we talk numbers then if you take a single fixed sound like say of a particular headphone or whatever target curve that you might design and come up with, uh, it's going to be the best possible sound by research for no more than like 17% of people. Whereas if you personalize sound with where we've got now with the sound ID technology, then it's like close to 85% of people say that, hey, I actually like this personalized sound better than whatever was the original sound of my headphones. So you can really get a huge amount of improvement in terms of how many people say that this is a great sounding thing according to their understanding of what good sound is. And uh, yeah, that's what we basically built this consumer side of sound ID product around. It's a technology that's kind of you know, encapsulated in a mobile app at the moment, but that basically uses uh, smart algorithms and some clever user experience to just kind of find out what is the best possible sound for you personally as an individual uh, based on that studio sound, but then adding this personalization layer on top of it. So according to our current thinking, that's the best solution to this translation problem there is. Music creators work on this flat neutral sound to get the best possible insight and uh, attention to detail in their recording and keep the confidence that they're doing good stuff. On the listener side, uh, it's best if it's personalized according to each person's uh, according to each person's uh, preference and taste. So in the current world, whatever consumer hears is somewhat randomly defined by their choice of headphones or devices that they're not really doing um, scientifically. They're just most often buying headphones by some other kind of uh, understanding of the build, design, brand, and whatever. So it's a sort of random EQ that's currently put between your song and the listener. And with the sound ID technology, we think that it's actually artist and the listener are in full control of what sound they hear. And that's uh, kind of the best solution there is. So when we're done with scaling this, then nobody should worry about translation as such anymore. You can fully devote yourself to the creative decisions and the making of music. Yeah. I, I love that idea because you're right. The way that most end listeners select their headphones um, isn't the way that I would recommend that they select their headphones. If someone were to say, Justin, I need to get a pair of headphones. Which do you think I should buy? This one or this one? Tell me which one's better. My mm -hmm. answer to them is invariably, take your phone or you know MP3 player, whatever device you have with you to a place where they have multiple sets of headphones and listen to some of your favorite music through each of those set, headsets of headphones and see which ones you like the sound of best. 
because those are the best headphones for you because they're all going to be skewed from neutral and you want to find ones that are, as an end listener, skewed from neutral in a way that really excites you and, uh, and, and turns you on. But out of all the people I've said that to, how many of them have taken my advice? I would be doubt if it's more than 10 or 15, 10%, maybe. Uh, Justin Gray says zero, and he might be right. But now, now, how, thing, now, how many of them would do that if that would be a process that they can do through an app within 60 seconds, right? Exactly. Right. And that's the thing that I love about Sound ID. I've done it. And for those of you who haven't done this, the consumer side of Sound ID yet, you should absolutely try it. It's fun to do. You get it on your app, you plug in your headphones, and the first thing it does is it's going to ask you what the headphones are, so it'll try to neutralize it knows the curve of your headphone so it'll neutralize that and then from there it kind of plays some samples for you and it's almost like a going to the eye doctor better like this better like this better like this better like this and you choose it and it creates that profile for you and i think that's much less of a hurdle to most people than going down to the store and trying out a bunch of headphones that feels inaccessible to most consumers but downloading an app and taking the headphones that you thought were neat based on other design properties or recommendation and then tailoring them for you, that's such a small hurdle to jump. So I, I really love how you guys design that in. Um, I think this has been a great foray into to the idea of sound quality, but I think we should keep on moving forward a little bit and we can circle back to this if we want to, because there's so many questions I, I want to touch on with you guys. You each bring such an interesting, different perspective to it. And going back to Justin Gray real quick, as someone who's predominantly a creator, do you have a feeling for you know what digital platforms are currently doing really well to enhance audio, audience experiences and connection with artists and what could be improved from where we are? Like, are there gaps in the current digital landscape um, that you think could be improved and are there aspects that you think are just happening amazingly well right now? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. I'm not saying it because Kristen's on this call, but I think SoundCloud has been a, uh, um, a, an absolute... Uh, game changer for artists. I mean, I mean, when did SoundCloud launch? I feel like it's probably 10 years now or something, right? I mean, it's, it's been out there for a minute. 12, 13 years. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, okay. you, you, you know, the, the, the default, uh, tool for artists right now is SoundCloud. Um, and, and so, and I think it continues to be, and I think what, what you guys have done well, again, I'm not trying to gas your plane here, but I think what you guys have done well is you stayed uh, ahead of the curve, uh, uh, of the technological curve, uh, that's that's sort of required in order to to continue bringing in new users and 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 on both sides, right? On consumers and on creators. Um, so so I think SoundCloud continues to be great. But you know, obviously, you're seeing people. You know, I just had a conversation with an artist uh, that we're talking about doing a deal with, who's made uh, you know who's done an incredible job this year of doing 15 second covers on TikTok. Like, I just think that again, there there are so many creative tools out there. And, and, you know, you did say something really interesting, Justin, when you were referring, Justin C., when you were referring to, uh, you know, maybe a, a smaller uh, um, fan footprint based on, uh, uh, you know, uh, on different platforms. But what I've always thought was interesting is that it would be really incredible. I mean, if, you know, massive superstar artists aside, it'd be really incredible if someone can figure out how to merge audiences across different uh, digital platforms, different DSPs, right? Like you see people, I've, look, I've worked with artists that have, you know, a hundred million views on a video on YouTube and that same song will get 4 million streams on Spotify, you know, makes no sense. Um, and so, so really, I think that's the next step for what artists need to do is how do you, you know, effectively aggregate or consolidate all of your fan listening experiences and, and, and creating a unique environment for your listeners. You know, one of the things that I find interesting is that and you see this a lot, especially with SoundCloud, is people releasing alt versions, people releasing B-sides, people releasing demo versions of songs. So I think that's become how consumers uh, um, find that kind of stuff, you know, like that those, those sort of like cool, cool listening experiences where Spotify does this, TikTok does this. And so um, it does become a full-time job for artists to, to, uh, to manage their content uh, in that way. And, uh, and again, it, it, it's, it's, it really comes down to the tools are completely and readily available to people. If they use them, uh, they can create massive benefits. And by the way, as we get out of this lockdown and as we start, you know, as, as we start, uh, getting exposed back to, you know, what we're all referring to as, you know, real life. Um, the idea is, uh, the people that took advantage of this time can now, turn that into a very significant 
professional bump in their career in, you know, at the end of this year and the next year. And, you know, all of a sudden there's, there's artists, there's, there's artists that are becoming successful. And like I said, I go back, SoundCloud did this initially, you know, there's people like the weekend weekend. I mean, Chris would know better, but the weekend had like 300 million okay. streams or something on SoundCloud before he, he even released a record commercially chance the rapper, you know, there's, there's, there's so much success. Uh, so though, I mean, honestly, as a platform, it's pretty incredible um, what they're doing. Actually, we're doing something with our, our platform called Midio, which helps artists make sure that all of their metadata is correct and accurate, even before it gets to SoundCloud. I know that's not, that's not what we're talking about, but that's, you know, I, from a, from a creator perspective, that's also what I'm trying to help solve is people just put music up on SoundCloud. And they have no idea what to do next. We're helping them create that, that path before it gets to SoundCloud so that they know what to do next. Right. Wonderful. I, I, I think there's a, a lot of great stuff you touch on there. And Krista, I'd love to hear this from your perspective too. What do you think that the you know current ecosystem of digital services have been doing right? What do you think we've nailed and you've just been excited by compared to where things started a decade ago? And where do you think is the, you know, the new battlefront that we we have to be successful on with streaming services? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Justin G covered a lot of incredible highlights, but just to add on, I really think what's special about SoundCloud, like we'll often say, you know, what's next in music is first on SoundCloud. And I think a lot of that comes down to the company's really heart and soul about democratizing music for everyone. I think SoundCloud itself is special in that, um, you know, we care about creators of all sizes, but especially long tail of creators and people who are just getting started. Um, it's on SoundCloud, we launched mobile upload um, last year. You know, you could record something on your phone raw and send it right up to SoundCloud. How many other platforms um, can you do that on? And so I think a lot of the kind of energy of the community comes from there. And there's a lot of really fantastic opportunities for finding your first audience and growing your community. As Justin was saying, right, The Weeknd, Chance the Rapper, Billie Eilish, so many names. Um, actually, there's one stat I wanted to highlight, but um, so many names um, that you know actually started out on um, SoundCloud. And the one stat I want to highlight was that in 2019, hip hop and R&B artists who started their careers on SoundCloud accounted for one third of the top 10 US top 200 billboard chart spots, which is um, wow. really, really exciting. And so I think SoundCloud was, you know, if you think of kind of music tech companies or DSP streaming services, it's really a special community because it was one of the first places and still is where artists can really have that first person presence. Um, as Justin was mentioning, it's a ton of work to manage your socials, but I think um, on SoundCloud, a lot of things we've done well is really lean into that deeper connection. So a lot of artists will host contests where they have fans, you know, remix a track or even finish a track or finish a verse using SoundCloud, which is really fun and also host AMAs with the um, community. And so you're talking also about where we could improve. I still think that there's a ton of room for improvement, as Justin was saying, you know, in that entire journey um, from creation all the way to you know, finding your first audience and followers and growing that into your own community. And so what my team really focuses on is that audience building flywheel. Like how do we help artists at every step of their journey and create even more um, immersive experiences where they can connect more deeply with fans. And I think something that we're always thinking about is, um, you know, how can we better help artists monetize? Um, at the end of the day, right, you want to make a living or you want to um, make enough to pour that back and invest that into your craft. And so, and also at the same time, many fans want to support the artists and be a part of that journey. So we're always thinking about more ways for fans to be able to directly support artists too. Absolutely. I think that's- uh, Well, actually, can I, just add one, can I just add one thing? Sorry, Please. I just want to add one thing, Justin, because I think this is really important. You know, again, Kristen, it's like the Mutual Admiration Society. Kristen, I think you're totally <laughs> yes. bang on. But the one thing I want to say is, you know, Look, we're, we're praising we're praising DSPs, but I do want to say something where I think uh, DSPs in general are falling down, which is songwriters are not being compensated fairly for the for the work that they're doing. And that is a real frustration. And so kind of like what Kristen mentioned, the idea of, of helping create and generate revenues for songwriters. Uh, and and help and you know there's there's you know there's a there's a, a, a frightening statistic something like you know ninety plus percent of songwriters that are affiliated to a performance rights organization like ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, SoCan in Canada, wherever, uh, are earning less than a hundred dollars a year. Like that's terrible. 
And so we need to, you know, that's part of what we're doing. Again, I'm not getting back on my tech, putting my tech hat on, but that's kind of part of what we're trying to fix. And what I love about, about what SoundCloud's done, and this is going to be a compliment, is SoundCloud was never about how do we charge an artist? How do we monetize off of the back of this artist? SoundCloud was always like, here is a platform for you to use uh, at will. You could, you could put up songs. You, could, you know, there, there, was, there was such a, 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 an incredible free version of SoundCloud available to, to, um, to, to artists to, to, to promote themselves. Uh, and I think that's been actually amazing uh, for, for, for the artistic community. Um, so even though that wasn't your idea, Kristen, kudos, because I think it's great. <laughs> yes, we want to keep building on top of that. So thank you for calling that out, Justin. I yeah. um, completely, completely agree. Yeah, that's interesting because, you know, a few years ago, I would have said something along the lines of there's no real great way to handle copyright issues in streaming services. And I think more and more that's been solved. Uh, YouTube kind of pioneered the content ID thing, which has its glitches and has its issues, but is a step up from where it was before, where it could be just kind of rampant music piracy, where at least we have the ability to identify things. But you've brought up a good point, Justin Gray, which is that um, that doesn't necessarily work for songwriters specifically. It works for rights holders of specific recordings, but then if your song is covered by someone else and covered by someone else and covered by someone else, there's no great automated way to do that. So um, there's a, another next step that uh, would make a lot of people a lot happier if we could get songwriters uh, rewarded in that same way. Uh, Martins, from your perspective, you have more of this background of designing tools and thinking about new creative solutions for tech companies. Are th there things you see to... An as an outsider from this, where you say, if I was working in this industry, here's what I'd be tooling on, or here's what I'd be proud of that we'd done. Okay. Uh, from what I see about this question, I think it's going more and more in the direction where it's about music, but it's increasingly about the kind of integrated experience of the creator, right? I think the kind of borderline between music creators and video creators, the kind of artists and the TikTokers, I mean, those borders are kind of less and less clear and those things are more and more merging together. It's no longer just about kind of clearly this is a music producer and clearly this is a video guy and clearly this is a computer gaming experience. Those things are kind of becoming more and more integrating. So if I would be, uh, if I would be in the SoundCloud, I would definitely try to think along the lines of hey where how do how do we kind of stay in that because the kind of plain audio it's kind of i mean clubhouse is an interesting phenomenon now which is kind of just like a pure audio experience but kind of the rest of the things that i see are kind of yeah just i mean audio is important and the music creation is definitely an important part so that's not to diminish the importance of music by no means but the kind of in terms of what the audience is after and what they're willing to experience now, especially in this kind of lockdown mode, it's kind of, uh, it's, it's more than audio kind of, uh, rarely anyone is just now sitting in a dark room, listening to music. It's kind of about having fun and about kind of, yeah, seeing complex things. And, uh, that's where I think the, I see the trend going. So. Wonderful. Now we touched a little bit on uh, revenue for artists and, um, I'd like to approach that, but really through the lens of how artists can build audiences to start with, so they can even think about revenue down the line, right? Getting people interested is step number one, and that comes probably before monetizing for most artists. And uh, Kristen, you've had a front row seat to see a lot of artists become successful on SoundCloud. And I'm wondering if there's any best practices we can draw from, like how can artists become more successful in connecting with fans and developing followers? And are there any best practices that you think we can learn from some of the biggest successes that you've noticed on modern digital platforms, particularly your own? Yeah, absolutely. Oh my gosh, there's a lot to unpack here. Where do I start? And I'd also love to hear Justin G's perspective from a creator too. So I think first I'll start with, you know, just on SoundCloud as a platform, I think there's a really unique relationship between creators and fans here. And it really allows for these massive underground followings to form organically. And that's where we see birthings of new communities, movements, and scenes that 
almost happen overnight. Um, a few I want to highlight are, you know, DigiCore, um, PC Music, um, their East African Underground. These are some recent ones on the platform that have really come to life. But I'll take a step back and switch over to kind of just getting started as an artist. Um, and I think there's a couple kind of basics we'd love to share about just SoundCloud. So I think one really, just mentioned this earlier, like really thinking about how you want to represent yourself across, you know, not only SoundCloud, but different social media spaces. And on SoundCloud, that's anywhere from from you know, optimizing your own pro profile and also optimizing your content, especially when you think about discovery, when you're uploading a track, we always tell artists to make sure they're adding a hashtag, they're adding a description so that people can actually find that track. That also helps our curation team discover it for different playlists and helps curators discover it too. So I think that's one portion I really wanted to emphasize because that discovering is so important. Um, I'll even emphasize a few other beginner tips for artists too about just engaging with your audience. So trying to grow your followers, but not just thinking of that number, actually connecting with them. We'll even say an easy thing you can do is, you know, put the first comment on your first track, ask your listeners a question. What do they think of it? Um, and make sure you're also social sharing across all different platforms. I think we were discussing a big challenge it for many artists is that they're different communities are spread out. You might have Discord, you might have YouTube, you might have Spotify, TikTok, SoundCloud, et cetera, um, Twitch. I was just on a panel recently with a friend, Jimmy Wisen for Twitch, and we we're emphasizing about how important it is to kind of cross-pollinate. Let you know your followers on one platform know to follow you on SoundCloud and vice versa and how to engage with you. So um, I can I can keep going and keep going, but those are a um, couple couple tips there I wanted to highlight. Yeah, that's great. And I'm also curious, are there activities outside of SoundCloud that you see that pay dividends within SoundCloud? Like what are things that yeah. people should be doing outside of that one platform that's going to help increase their notoriety there? Yeah. So I think first, um, one thing that we've seen that has been really successful, what's special about SoundCloud is that you can upload, you know, your track and you can upload just a 15 second or 30 second teaser and then go back and edit it when you want to drop the full track. And we've noticed a lot of artists you know, prepare that and then share it out across all their other platforms and socials, kind of getting them hyped for when they're going to drop the track on SoundCloud. It's funny, I actually, as I'm watching TikTok, I see so many um, fans requesting in the comments, please drop this in SoundCloud, please drop this in SoundCloud. And then the artists will go and respond when they do drop it. So I think that's one. Um, a second best practice that's been really exciting in terms of audience engagement and using other platforms. I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but doing a variety of contests and involving, um, you know, just the fact that it's so easy to upload to SoundCloud is really special. So those remix contests, um, asking fans to complete a verse or track, when you host those, definitely share them across all your different forms of social media and engage there because it creates a lot of um, fun hype and fuels discovery. Yeah, that's great. And uh, one last question to piggyback on this one yeah. is, do you have any best practices around frequency of content? Because I mean, there's two schools of thought, quality versus quantity. Mm -hmm. You probably want to have a balance of both. And one of the great things about SoundCloud in particular is how kind of raw and off the cuff some of the experience can be. And that kind of tilts mm -hmm. you in the direction of quantity, but there's probably a point where there's too much quantity. So are there any specific best practices or philosophies to take into to balancing those, those two ideas? Yeah, I think first I will say, especially to all those creators getting started, you know, don't give up, um, keep posting and don't be shy and post, get feedback, tap into the community. Um, there's a really special one there. So staying motivated, I think is key and um, whatever frequency works for you is also important. I mean, we'll see, and it also depends on the type of artist, for example, right? Some podcasters um, are uploading weekly versus other artists may have more, you know, drop something every quarter. I think that's um, pretty personal and maybe Justin Gray can share a little bit more there. But um, what I will say is when I think about posting, I just don't think about um, uploading new content in music. Um, we'll even, in, you know, you can upload any type of audio to SoundCloud. So we'll even have artists, you know, just share a little voice snippet about what inspired them to create a track. So I think there's other really interesting ways you can kind of post and engage um, on SoundCloud, which is exciting, but I can give a few couple times of best times to post Please. and engage. And so on the, I was just pulling up these stats here, but on the weekday, um, for the US, 3 p.m. is the prime hour for maximum reach. And then outside of the US, 5 p.m. is the prime hour for maximum reach. And it's interesting, habits change on the weekend. And so on the weekend, um, 
outside of the U.S., um, we kind of see the sustained audience size, um, but we and we see this smaller audience, but more people are getting more deeply engaged on the weekend. And so mm-hmm. we're usually looking at a lot of engagement kind of between 12 p.m. and 7 p.m., which is really interesting. Awesome. And then so there's not really specific ideas as far as frequency, but timing three in the afternoon for U.S. people, five uh, in the afternoon for uh, worldwide people. I want to turn to Justin Gray's perspective in just a second, but I just have one more question I have for you before I do, uh, because it's so rare to get to speak to someone in your position, and it's uh, uh, awesome to hear um, from your perspective. So uh, the last quick question I have around this is collaborating with others. Do you find that this is beneficial? Like, is there ever lightning rod moments where you have one SoundCloud user collaborating with Mm -hmm. another and that kind of amplifying audiences? Uh, How is that type of kind of creator-creator interaction, has that ever helped in in launching careers or getting more visibility? Yeah, absolutely. So I will take a step back since I've I've worked on a lot of content and creator ecosystems at SoundCloud, Twitch, and also Pinterest. And I will say, you know, no matter whether it's, um, you know, cooking recipes, recipes, creating music, or um, streaming video games together, anytime I've seen creators collaborate, um, magic happens. I think it's for a couple of reasons, right? You get really incredible, exciting, innovative content um, that's ultra creative. And I think also it's a special moment to bring both of their communities and audiences together and helps with discovery and amplification. So I, um, I love that you asked that question. That is something that our team is often thinking about, and I've observed, I've observed across several different industries. All right, cool stuff. Now, Justin Gray, you've worked with a tremendous number of high-profile artists. I'm sure you've also worked with artists towards the beginning of their careers. And I'd love to get a sense from you, from the perspective of, of, of working with diff- so many different artists and knowing them personally, what separates the ones who have really done a great job of connecting with fans, finding listeners, finding followers for the, for their music, and those who kind of frittered out and didn't have that type of success? Are there any common personality traits or best practices on that front that you really feel like leads to audience uh, acceptance? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, first of all, I, I always say this uh, to anybody that I work with, you can make somebody look, but you can't make them like when meaning, you know, you can you can get your music out in front of somebody, but if they don't like you, they don't like you. You know, um, I actually think that as listeners, taste has evolved from since we were kids, you know, from when we were kids, you could, you know, it, it wasn't until Run DMC and Aerosmith, you know, mashed up that you could listen to hip hop and rock, you know. And so I think but now I think listeners, listener habits are so broad now that um that you really if you make good content, anything can happen. Now, to go back to your other question, yes. I'll tell you, there's a there's a personality trait of people that uh, go from you know zero to a hundred uh, versus ones that go to from zero to ten and just kind of you know putter out, and that is that those artists that ultimately find success uh, um, are they look at this is their job, right? They understand that you know, and and when I explain it to people, like look, t- take an artist like uh, who's the biggest artist in the world, Bruno Mars. We'll just say Bruno Mars as an example. Right? You take Bruno Mars, he spends four or five months making a record, he'll spend three years touring that record, right? So he'll put in a, and and and, and especially if you look at it in, in terms of hours, he'll put in maybe 20 times more uh, time spent and, 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 and sweat equity in, in promoting and marketing than he will in making the record. And I think that sometimes artists don't realize that the fun part is the recording. The hard part is the marketing. You know, a lot of people, like I said, there's a lot of access to a lot of equipment and there's a lot of talent and there's and there's other things like splice that make making music easier and better and faster. Right. It's like, how, but but then if, if you believe in yourself, you have to then put in the the sweat equity. And, and, so, and a lot of times, again, I'm sure Christian will, will will acknowledge this. These are people that don't have managers. These are people that these are artists that don't have a support system. There's somebody sitting in their basement or in their bedroom or whatever hence the pajamas, making music, right? And so the idea is if you're going to make those songs, look, it's great if your mom and your girlfriend or your boyfriend or whoever, they think you're great, amazing. That's the first hurdle, right? But then it's like, if you believe in yourself, how do you push that out? And every artist has a different strategy and a different tactic. You know, I want to go back to, you talked about frequency of posting. 
Look, I think we're in a very interesting time right now where there's a more authentic connection between a listener and a, and a, and an artist, right? Between a, a creator and a consumer. It's more authentic. You know, the idea that Cardi B can post something on her Instagram page and you know that, you know, you feel, at least you feel like it's coming from her. You're feeling an authenticated, you know, validated and authentic connection to, to your favorite artist now. And, uh, and, and so smart and creative uh, um, artists that I'm seeing that are that are taking that are going okay. Who who what lane do I sit in, and how can I go and glean from the success of people that are more more renowned than I am, and how can I lean into their audiences? And there's all kinds of other cool opportunities to lean into other people's audiences. And um, but again, it's like that's their job. That's their job every day. Uh, it's okay. I've made the music, but I'm going to spend eight hours uh, today. Uh, you know. Dealing with doing my SoundCloud, doing my TikTok, doing my Instagram, doing my Twitter, like whatever it is that connects. Because if you're not going to champion yourself, I can promise you nobody else is going to champion you. Yeah, that's yeah. a great point. And is it okay if I jump in just to Please. piggyback on that? Yeah, thank you so much, Justin. I think I just wanted to um call out to right. It's it, it is a business, right? You like just up uploading is the first start of what we kind of call the audience building flywheel. You need to put in a lot of blood, sweat, and tears to really build that. And I think what's been special about SoundCloud is we offer a lot of tools, right? We're all about democratizing music and making it accessible. And so there's a lot of tools to help you not only distribute on SoundCloud itself, but also distribute um, across all major music services or pitch tracks to different playlists to for discovery. And so I think that's a big thing, right? Like many artists, when you're getting starting started out, you're wondering, um, it's your first time, you know, where are those tools? What should you do? You don't necessarily have a manager yet. So it's all about, right? The bedroom, bedroom producer just getting started. Also, I think posting music too, you know, I, I think that it, it's, you know, I remember one of my first significant successes um, as a, even as a producer was I worked with an artist, posted something on, it's going to go back a hundred years, posted something on MySpace um, and, um, and, and got discovered, you know, had that song never gotten posted, he never gets discovered. Perhaps the, you know, his career it doesn't, evolve in the way that it should. So, you know, a lot of times artists are very precious about, you know, like, I mean, my 13 year old the other day was talking about her brand. I'm like, really? Okay. So, um, you know, I, I think that, I think that the, the idea is, is your brand is your music and, and those things can evolve. And if you do something today, you could be proud of it. And, and, and that's the other thing, spend time, make it the best that it can be, put it up. And, and just, uh, you know, as Chris was saying, get that feedback, earn that feedback back from your audience. People are, and by the way, as everybody knows, social media could be harsh. <laughs> People might be like, this is terrible, or, oh my God, this is amazing, or whatever. But at least you get that feedback. And then if you, again, if and if you are a, a clever artist, you're going to say, oh, that they like this stuff. Therefore, I'm going to do more of this stuff. Again, part of my tech platform is giving some of that real-time feedback to users that are pitching music through our, through our platform. So again, I think that there's so many incredible tools that are available for people to get better, faster, and bigger. Uh, uh, I should say better, bigger, bigger, better, bigger, and faster uh, than, than there ever were. I mean, you know, back when I was in bands, it was, you, we would have to schlep equipment up and down stairs in crappy clubs and, and send, you know, FedExes out with cassette tapes and our demos. And, you know, and now discovery is literally instant. You know, you're seeing people going from, from complete anonymity to, you know, a hundred thousand, you know, streams overnight, literally overnight, uh, through the power of, of well-placed and, and, and well-crafted social media. So, um, that's the time we're in. And by the way, then it's preserving that, right? Again, you can make people look, you can't make them like. So great, we got them. We got 100,000 streams. What are we doing next? Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, that cuts both ways, but it's an exciting time. It's an incredibly exciting time. Yeah. And I really thought it was interesting, something that you said right towards the beginning of your answer there, which was that making the record is the fun part. We see this as being the fun part. And then mm -hmm. Bruno Mars or whoever spends you know, three, four, five, who knows how many more times actually promoting it than just creating it. And I wonder if to a degree you have to find ways to make promoting it also the fun part. Because mm -hmm. if it's not also the fun part and it's just pulling teeth every single mm -hmm. time, are you actually going to do it and, and finding ways to make that engaging and fun for you? Well, I think I think the gamification with the, the again, the two the two sides of 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 the like, right? The two sides of of the of the uh, of the of the, the the thumbs up or the like on social media, right? It's like the gamification of I put up a post, 
people liked it. I got more likes this time than I did last time, or I got less less likes this time than I did last time. Again, if, as long as you're not chasing the likes and you're chasing the sort of the data that you personally can 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 glean from it, um, then I think that that is again that's a, a huge advantage to artists. Um, but the, you know, there's there's a gamification strategy, right? There's a there's a there's a validation that comes along with more likes, more access, more visibility. Totally. Now, Martins, I know this isn't your area of expertise, but um, are there any things that you've noticed from, because you're in a company that interacts with so many musicians mm -hmm. who use your product and so many producers and engineers that use your product. And you're, I know you're a voracious consumer of music as well. So um, are there any best practices that you've noted or you think are worth adding to this, uh, this mix? Honestly, I think kind of uh, what Kristen and Justin just covered were basically kind of uh, what I would also very much subscribe to. So uh, adding to that, that, uh, yeah, nowadays I think there is more than ever opportunity to create wherever like you, you feel like, right? You can now do it in the bedroom. You can do it. Some of our friends are mixing in the deserts or mm -hmm. on the trains when that was kind of, uh, when traveling was still a thing. So, uh, so kind of the opportunity of creating wherever you feel like is now more abundant than ever, but mm -hmm. I think it, boils more than ever down to what uh, Justin G was saying that, yeah, if you go to the, if you just do from one to 10, or you actually go to a hundred and do all, all the things that are necessary to actually uh, get yourself known and get yourself promoted. Can I, can I ask Chris a question? Do you mind? I know, I know you're the moderator, Justin C, but can I ask Kristen a question? How, how, uh, of, of, uh, on SoundCloud and you, you, you don't have to be specific, but on SoundCloud, how many, uh, are creators, in other words, how many are people that are uploading music and how many are consumers? In other words, how many people are finding music and consuming it? Oh, great question. I don't, I'm just checking my notes. I don't know if I have the latest numbers from, from the team, but I do know that we, yeah, I do know we have, let, let me see what I have. I know we have um, 250 million tracks and I think that Right. I just want to emphasize again, I'll see if I can pull some numbers there, but um, there are a ton of creators and a lot of listeners. And I think it really plays into that scenes initiatives. And I think what's special about SoundCloud that I can say a lot of the people who are listeners are creators themselves. Um, so they're going, I remember when I was interviewing for SoundCloud and, you know, learning about the platform, this one quote from Pharrell, um, resonated with me so much. And he was saying that he went to SoundCloud to get inspiration for his next um, album because he just was hearing the same things, you know, on the radio or the top charts. And so I guess, um, let me see if I could get those numbers, but I will say, I think that's what's really special about the platform. Like there's a lot of kind of fluidity, fluidity there. I mean, I just wonder if like 30% are consumers, are, are creators and 70% are consumers, you know, like, I mean, just whatever. So I didn't mean to put you on the spot. Sorry. Oh, no, no, that's yeah. okay. Well, I can also follow up with you after this, Justin. Yeah. Like you said, it's a little complex to figure out because if someone's gone there and they've uploaded six tracks, you know, but they do the majority of their listening on SoundCloud, are they a creator or a listener? And the answer is kind of both. Maybe more a listener, but who, it's, it's, it's hard to say. But practically, probably practically every... Uh, creator on there is also a listener to some degree and uh, to would, some degree. Would you, actually guys, would you actually guys say that there is this trend of more and more people becoming creators and also this borderline between creator and listener kind of disappearing uh, as we kind of yeah move on in time? As it maybe well should be, you know, I mean, it's funny when some people talk about how there's this competition from these people who are willing to give their music away for free and, but it's like, I don't know, to really appreciate music, you have to understand music a little bit, you know, whether you want to play or sing or write, like there's a, a little bit of that. And I think almost it's a very participatory activity. Do you have any uh, thoughts on that, uh, Justin or uh, Kristen? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, you know, <laughs> yeah, I do actually, because I think that the more the more readily available music for people to consume, ultimately, the better it is for everybody in 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 this value chain of music right and it's consumers uh, creators uh you know ultimately licensors right like you know you know i do a lot of work in film and tv as you indicated early on it's you know his songs are being discovered through TikTok and licensed you know we we've done you know we've done like we did a license last year with directly with TikTok for a song with with a brand that we did directly directly in TikTok. it never 
came out of the TikTok universe. And so, uh, uh, yeah, I think that there is, there is uh, again, there's, there's so many exciting ways for, for, for monetization to happen um, and, for, and for, you know, artists to find opportunity. Um, yeah, again, more than ever. I feel like I've said that a few times, but, you know. Yeah, I'll just add on there. Um, I like I really think that anyone who is consuming music can get inspired and become a creator. And I think that's something we think a lot about at SoundCloud, right? There's probably a couple people who maybe they have some tracks ready or they've been thinking about it, but they're not ready to take that next step. And so I think really what we try to do is make that kind of barrier to entry as low as possible so that they can dip their toe in the water, you know, see how their track performs and keep getting inspired and um uploading right i think on so many platforms it's just this doesn't apply only to music but also other content sometimes you feel like you have to have on instagram for example a perfectly polished grid um right for it to go up but i think what's special about soundcloud too is right upload something raw like we have a lot of people upload um from their phones that's how i think mumble rapping even started perhaps um and i think that the more creativity we can see and the more we can inspire people the more great um, music we're going to get yeah, I think music is sexy too. I mean, I, I you know, I, I, I'm not, I, I, there's there's a sexiness that's that's part of music, right? Like, you know, there's there's rock stars. There's 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 something that is intrinsically connects to people even beyond the music. And so, um, I'm going to use a very strange and awkward segue, but here it is. You know, I think that what 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 Martin's has done is created a sexier way to enhance the listening experience on the music that we're trying to create, right? So we're taking sexy and amplifying sexy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, it's an interesting thing where if you look back at human norms, like throughout you know most of the, our history as a species, music was this communal activity where everybody participated, where you'd have, you know, the tribe is around the campfire and sure there's maybe those guys and gals who are the best singers or remember all the lyrics uh, to the, you know, tribal songs and uh, or keep the best rhythm, but everyone's participating and it's kind of baked in our DNA to both listen to and create music and, um, you know, it's and also this is true in so many activities yourself justin if i remember correctly you're a hockey player right yeah. and i would imagine that almost everyone who watches hockey at one point played hockey and maybe there are some exceptions to that but probably a lot of people who watch hockey have played hockey at least some point in their lives and i think that's true of the most voracious music fans that a lot of them even if they don't keep up with it now took music lessons or something and have musical bones in their bodies to some degree well i do I do think people have music, music, even if you are literally tone deaf and have no rhythm, you can't tell me that you haven't sung in a shower or tapped your steering wheel to a, you know, to a song in the car. <laughs> so I, you know, so it, I, I'm with you. I think that there's something that, that it's in our DNA. I think that it's um, in terms of socializing in, in the, in the 21st century, well, specifically last year, you know, people <laughs> miss, people miss this united experience of being in a rock concert, being in a, being at a show or, or, or even being in a movie theater, you know, but if we're going to just limit it to music, you know, having, having a mutual experience, uh, mutual human experience all at the same time. Right. Mm -hmm. which is, which is, a, which is a show, which is a concert, which is a, you know, a, a house, an acoustic house performance. Um, so, yeah, I mean, again, even in my tech company, we're only trying to hire people that have some sort of can play a guitar or, or, or have to have a love of music. Um, and, and I think that that's really important that you make a great point. So yes, I think it's in all of us. I think yeah. it's absolutely in all of us. Well, we've, uh, gone over an hour here. This has been a fantastic conversation. I'd love to just get uh, one last question out to you guys, uh, to kind of bring us full circle back around to what Sonar Works and Sound ID do, which is helping people make better sounding records that are more likely to resonate with end listeners. So this one's probably directed a little bit more towards uh, Justin Gray and to Martin's, but just a, a quick tip from you in closing, um, Justin, starting with you, how can producers be more successful in creating great sounding releases for fans who are listening across a variety of formats? Going back to what we were talking about in the beginning, some people are listening on high-end headphones, high-end speakers, some people are on the laptop speakers or their phones. And what do you think are the best practices to make sure that your music works no matter where and how people are listening? Well, I'll start with some technical things. The first technical thing is you don't have to use every single plugin in your digital workstation on every single track all the time, right? <laughs> Uh, you know, it's, sometimes it could just be that simple. I mean, even in a lot of records that I do, you know, I make sure I make sure that it sounds good going in. And, and I want to go back to something we said way earlier, which is the intention of what it was of, 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 you know, of how we're creating music. Right. 
a digital workstation, doesn't matter if you're Pro Tools or Ableton or Logic or, or FL Studio or, you know, Studio One, whatever. They're just complete blank slates. They're going to sound exactly how you want them to sound. So if you want it to sound crappy uh, and you or you settle for crappy sounds, that's what it's going to sound like. There's no magic that's going to fix that, right? So um, I would say the first thing is collaborate. Try and find people to pull into your universe that that maybe uh, uh, take a you know fill fill a gap that you don't have creatively. Um, that's the first thing. Uh, and the second thing is constantly be creating. You know you're going to get better every single time you do a new song. Maybe you're going to get. Maybe you're going to step backwards a couple of times, but the whole point is there's there's an evolution of your growth uh, as a creator. So the idea is collaborate, create, uh, and release your music. Uh, and don't obsess, you know, again, don't obsess about the sonic quality. And that's when that's where, for me, SonarWorks comes in, is that I can now, re th there's one less obsession that I need to concern myself with, right? If, if, if a kick drum or the bottom end of a song that I'm doing is reacting in a certain way, uh, I know that that's, that's, it sounds good. It, it translates to my car, it translates to my crappy AirPods, it translates to my you know fancy Focal headphones. And I've seen a way, for me creatively, I've seen a way smaller gap now between how I'm hearing my own work in multiple different environments. Um, and, uh, and, and I, and, and it's, and it's actually been a revolution in how I've, again, I said this earlier, gotten to the finish line of creativity faster so I can go on and work on the next thing. So yeah, I would say collaborate, cr create, collaborate, finish your work. Don't get obsessed by finishing, by, by having unfinished stuff, get it done, clear that energy for what's coming next and just, and just go and just be, just be consistent. I have to just give a ring endorsement to the idea of actually putting stuff out, actually releasing stuff. And uh, you have to remember that if you're really ambitious about this and you plan to make music part of your life and music creation part of your life for the long term, there's going to be a lot of releases and absolutely 0% of them are going to be perfect. And at a certain point, you have to let one creation out there so you can start working on the next, which can be even better. And um, well, Rick sometimes Rubin people says forget that brilliant. part. Rick Rubin said something really interesting in an interview. He said, if you put, if you put out music that everybody is just kind of like, yeah, it's pretty good. You failed. If mm -hmm. you put out music where half the people are like, this has changed my life. And half the people are like, oh my God, this is utter garbage. He goes, that's how you know you're doing something right. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> the more succeed you succeed, the more hate is you're going to get. Yeah. Now, it is Martins, no hate. I'd love to ask, turn around and ask the same question uh, to you. Uh, in addition to using sound ID reference, which everyone obviously should do. And if you haven't done it already, I don't know why. And I don't know why you're tuning into this. You should go do it. Um, what are some additional best practices that you think you can add on top of getting your EQ correction right through something like Sound ID Reference? What are the few other little components that you think are going to help people make better sounding releases that translate? Uh, I mean, I kind of can't, can't escape myself, but I'm. Uh, I hope this point is a little broader than just using sound ID reference. But <clears throat> I would say, kind of try to get the technology out of your way, really, mm -hmm. so that you can actually spend all of your effort and kind of passion on actual creativity. Because mm -hmm. once you, if you have technology that you're not completely kind of convenient with, and that you're not kind of fluid with then you're kind of going to spend time kind of second guessing yourself or going to spend time trying to figure how it works but kind of from what i understand kind of about the world of music creation and creativity in general you kind of you have to get on this wave and you have to get kind of in the mood and that kind of best works when you can drop most of the things that are not relevant include i mean the best technology is the one that you actually don't notice that kind of fits so seamlessly into your life and into your workflow that you can stop thinking about it and i think getting to that point is uh, yeah kind of uh, that's wonderful what, and that's what, what sound important. id reference ultimately that philosophy is baked into it it's about mm. making your speakers disappear more and your room disappear more so that you can just react to what you're hearing and make decisions with mm. confidence so it's uh that can and, apply and to I, so many I, places but definitely applies there if i could just add one more thing kind of to to what justin was saying before and i'm sure Kristen will agree that uh it's actually funny that uh, the same thing about kind of uh, the that, uh, advice about music that you have to keep releasing it. I think it's very much the same thing that uh, people in the software world are saying. Kind of, mm -hmm. if you're building a piece of software, you actually have to keep releasing it and kind of rather push it over the edge a little sooner so that you can get feedback. So, it's uh, yeah. <laughs> Paralysis, <laughs> very, by very yeah. Paralysis by analysis. Paralysis by analysis. Exactly. Yeah, yeah.
sometimes you just got to put things out there and then iterate, you know? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Well, I so think that's a great big, big truths are true outside one domain, right? <laughs> Very much so. Yeah. Uh, well, I think that's a great note uh, to end it on. Uh, it, you guys should check out the latest iteration of Sound ID Reference if you haven't already. I'd love to just ask uh, real quick for each of you guys where we can find out more about you and uh, follow each of you. So uh, Justin Gray, uh, where are the best places for people to kind of keep up with what you're doing and check out what you've been up to? Yeah. Um, so check me out on Instagram at I am Justin Gray, which is spelled G-R-A-Y. Uh, and uh, also, I'd love you to check out my tech platform, Midio.com, M-D-I-I-O.com. And uh, of course, my website, I am Justin Gray.com. So thanks again for having me, you guys. This has been really incredible. Uh, Martins, you're, you, are, you are literally changing the way that people are creating music. And um, you should be applauded for that. It's, it's groundbreaking. Thank you. I'm flattered to hear that. Wonderful. And uh, Kristen, where are the best places to keep up uh, with what you're doing and find out more about what's happening with you and with SoundCloud? Yeah, absolutely. I'd say um, Twitter, Instagram, or LinkedIn. I'm on all of them. I'm Kristen M. Chen. So care, I-S-T-I-N-M-C-H-E-N. You can find me there. And just wanted to say thank you again for having me today. It's been so great to um, connect with all of you and always happy to chat about this. So Thank yeah. you again for having me. Been wonderful to have you on. And Martin's, uh, before I ask you, I'll tell you that this is part of a whole series of conversations that's happening on, around the release of Sound ID Reference. So definitely check it out. Where are the best places for people to find out, first of all, to follow you personally and to find out more about the latest version of Sound ID Reference? Sure. So I'm uh, personally, I'm on Instagram and Facebook. You can find me my, by my surname there. And then, uh, obviously, it's all the social accounts of SonarWorks that uh, keep coming up with the latest and greatest news about what we're up to. Good stuff. All right. Thanks to all of you for being here, part of this conversation. It was absolutely wonderful to have you. Uh, thank you to SonarWorks and Sound ID for helping this whole conversation happen. Thanks to you guys for hanging out with us. See you next time. 